please welcome to the stage, David Friedman. Understand me when I share my dream with you. I want to be rich, famous, and powerful. Step on all my enemies and never do a thing. I want to be rich, famous, and powerful. So all I have to do in life is sit around and sing. I don't want to work, struggle, or compromise. When I set a goal, I want to reach it right away. Because paying your dues, that's just for other guys. As for me, I want what I want, and I want it all today! I don't want to audition, I don't want to take class. I want to be discovered while I'm sitting on my ass. I should not have to suffer, I should not have to sweat. I tried that for ten minutes once, and look, what did I get? I'm still not rich, famous, and powerful. Barbara Streisand has it all, and I can do what she can do. So why is she rich, famous, and powerful? While I'm still stuck here schlepping through my life like all of you. What does it take to be famous and powerful? God, if you are listening, please tell me what to do. What do I have to fake to be famous and powerful? I've done everything I can, and now the rest is up to you. I tried being good. I tried being nice. I even tried pretending I was listening once or twice. But the really big stars have made it without it. Was Betty Davis pleasant? Well, I seriously doubt it. Still, she was rich! Everyone adored her, and the world was at her feet. And she was a bitch! It's obvious that I have gotten nowhere being sweet. <laughs> now I know I should be thankful for the blessings that I've got. There are those who truly worship me, and starving, I am not. I'm really not. Does this piano make me <laughs> I suppose good friends and family and health count for a lot. But I have to admit, all that doesn't mean shit if I'm not rich, famous, and powerful. Oh, come on, don't be so shocked. You know you feel the same as I. If we were rich, famous, and powerful, we could take all those agents and casting directors, tiny apartments and back tax collectors, critics and casting calls, chilly rehearsal halls, people who bore us, and jobs, and the chorus, and kids. to ask. You. You're probably wondering why I started with that touching that one. <laughs> no, I wrote that song in 1992. I was 42 years old, so you can put away your calculators, I'm 62 years old. And at the time I wrote it, I was fond of saying, of all the songs I'd ever written, that one was probably the truest. And strangely enough, was often the one that most people seem to identify with. Now, up until that time, I really thought that life was about being successful, having money, showing something to the world. And I was writing all these songs of spirit and healing, but to tell the truth, I was writing them so that they would be hits, so that I would be rich, famous, and powerful. 
And in some way, I didn't really understand what other value they could have other than to make me rich, famous, and powerful. Uh, one time, I got a letter from someone saying, Dear David, I was about to kill myself, and I heard your song, Help Is On The Way, and I decided not to kill myself. And my moving and spiritual response to that was, fine, you didn't kill yourself. Did I have a hit with that song? Did I make a million dollars with that song? I have a lot of friends who write songs that wouldn't make anybody not kill themselves, and they have Grammys, and they have... Now... That's a familiar thought, isn't it? Uh, so, I sort of understood that there might be something a little off about that. So I took this problem to a spiritual teacher with whom I was studying extensively at the time. Now, I was studying with her in order to figure out how spiritual principles could make me rich, famous, and powerful. And she knew this, and she knew that that's why I was thinking. So she said to me, what I want you to do is uh, make up a, a virtual bank account. And every time you get a letter like that, or a comment, or somebody tells you that your song has saved their life or helped them or changed them in some positive way, write down $10,000. And I did this, and I was a millionaire in short order. And so interestingly enough, that song was a turning point of my life because that ridiculous rant about materialism and my frustration with it and also the little thought in the back of my mind that perhaps even if as I was getting more material stuff, it wasn't doing anything, it wasn't helping me, was the source of my beginning to shift from a life that had to do with uh, seeing things on the exterior and thinking that that was what was important to understanding that my whole life took place in my interior and that it was only the interior that was important. So this song, this show is called Songs That Have Written Me. And I call it that because I want to share what I've come to understand about songwriting at 62 that I didn't understand at 42 and certainly didn't understand at 21. That songs have become, rather than vehicles for me to make a mark on the world, they've become my connection to spirit, my connection to something higher than me, to something or someone who knows more than I do. And what I've found is that the best songs that come to me often come to me at times when I'm lost, when I have no knowledge of what to do or, uh, or what the solution to something is. And they come because I open up to something that comes to me. They don't come from me, they come to me, and I receive them, I try to use them for myself, and I pass them on. And what's interesting is that the way I had to learn those lessons was often through things that you would call disasters and upsets and tragic things. And so, so after Rich, Famous, and Powerful, a few years later, the disasters started happening. And this was when I really learned what I needed to learn. I would say the first time I really understood that a song had come to me, not from me, was in 1995 when Nancy Lamont died. When Nancy died, uh, she was my muse. We had worked for years. She was just about to break into the big time. Uh, you know, she was about to play Carnegie Hall. She, her records were all over the country. And she died at the age of 43. And I became quite despondent. And I thought I would never write again. People were waiting to hear what it was that I might have to write. And uh, I just couldn't think of anything to write. I just, I just thought, this is over. And I was walking down the street one day. And all of a sudden, this song came to me in such fullness that I had to go into a stationery store and buy pen and paper quickly to write it down before it got away. And it seemed to me that this song almost came from Nancy. And I couldn't help but notice that given how I felt about this situation, it was shocking that this is the song that would come out of me. It couldn't have come out of me. It came through me and to me. Did you hear that? Let's see if we can hear it again. Oh my god. You know, 
talk about spirit. I put three music stands up here, and three microphones, and three pieces of music, in hopes that perhaps some girls might appear. And not only have they appeared, but they appeared at a table that had a spotlight on it. <laughs> Girls, do you think you might come up here and sing along? Okay. Come on. term, but in fact, the term girls is the proper term for any backup singer, no matter what their sex, and no matter what their age. They are girls. Actually, Joel Fram, our conductor at uh, Scandalous, every day he calls someone different in the orchestra, girl. Like our six foot five trumpet player, you know, girl, would you play that? <laughs> So now these girls, uh, we've been working together for several decades, so I would imagine that you are, I don't want to reveal anything, but you're probably in your very, 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 very late 20s. Because <laughs> you were in your very, 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 very late teens the last time we were here. And uh, I wouldn't dream of being on stage without them. I don't do this very often. The last time I did it was 12 years ago with the Firebird. And, uh, 
I, I just love working with them, not only because they are glorious musicians, but because they are so supportive of me. Uh, they, they, it's just a joy for us to work together, so please say hello officially to Emily Bindiger, Diane Garisto, and Margaret Dillon. supportive they are. Last time we did this show, my microphone was over here and it started shaking and I thought, oh, this is going to be annoying, but then it suddenly stopped shaking and I discovered that Emily was sitting with her foot out here for the entire show uh, and I think I probably still owe you some chiropractic. Uh. <laughs> so, Trust the Wind. Trust the Wind taught me that there are solutions that I don't necessarily know the answer to. There are two solutions to problems. It taught me that there are ways of looking at things, and it taught me most of all that we cannot know what anything is for. My partner, Reverend Sean Moninger, says that all the time. We do not know what anything is for. So when something happens, we have to trust it. We have to go with it. We have to know that it is moving us toward something. Now, in 1999, uh, oh, by the way, I'm gonna sing about three songs that uh, don't involve you, and then I'm going to ask you to sing later. So if you guys would just be very unobtrusive. And, 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 uh, uh, maybe, maybe a little less obtrusive than that. <laughs> so, in 1999, I was in about my 35th year of therapy. Um, I, can, I can be very slow. And I came to a very important realization. You know, we all have an inner child in us, someone, a, a, a historical being who was disappointed in ways that never got resolved, that never got uh, handled. And we often spend our whole lives trying to find the perfect husband or the great amount of money or the, the perfect job or fame or fortune, something that we think will fill it, and it's not possible to fill it because that boat sailed when we were infants, and that empty place stays in us. And I had the realization that there is actually one person who can fill that, and that person is me. That I have been there for everything that has happened to me, and I am the only one who could be depended on to have perfect empathy for everything. And so this song came to me with that realization. And I thought to myself, why now? Why am I writing this song? Uh, because I wrote it to myself. I wrote it to sing to my own inner child. Now, being a songwriter and still having remnants of wanting to be rich, famous, and powerful, I disguised that fact. And so you could think it was written to someone else, and in fact, I gave it to my best friend from childhood, Pat, as, as a gift. And I meant it, but I didn't really write it for her, I wrote it for me, and then passed it on to her. So this song was for me to sing to my inner child, and I thought, huh, why would I need to sing to my inner child? I mean, I've I'm successful, I'm, I've been in a relationship for 15 years and plan to be in it for the rest of my life. I've had a lot of therapy, I'm a grown-up, I have a very stable life. And this was an example of a song that was given to me because spirit knew something I didn't and knew that I would need to be prepared for something and have something to help me deal with it. Six months after I wrote this song, that relationship ended in one day. I had no idea it was going to happen. I was shocked. Even though, in looking back, I look and see I had shifted my thought from I wish he would love me in the way I want to be loved to I'm willing to be loved in the way I want to be loved. And that since I was not willing to leave, and he was not willing to love me in the way I wanted to be loved, he had to leave. So, spirit worked it out in some way, but I was in shock. And I, for a whole year, every day, I would put my arms around myself and sing this song to myself. So if you need to sing to your inner child, let's bring it up.
This song is just for you, no one else can hear. Nobody is listening, no one else is near. The pain you're going through, only I can see. Cause I'm so close to you, you're a part of me. I can hold you, I can take you in my arms, let you know I understand, and that I always will be there. And when I hold you, though I can't keep you from harm, I can love you, I can listen, I can care. I can hold you through the darkness and despair. I see you crying for all the years you've lost, for all that might have been and all those years of cost. Alone you've tried and tried and still the pain goes on. But I'll be by your side until the pain is gone. I can hold you till the sorrow goes away, till the tears are crying, the wound is healed, the past is in the past. And when I hold you, surely there will come a day when it's better, when it's different, when you're free. I can hold you, and it's gonna change, you'll see. For though you think that hope has died, all your dreams are gone. I know that somewhere locked inside your spirit still lives on. Your heart is so afraid to care, afraid that there'll be no one there. But here I am, and I swear I'm not going anywhere. Let me hold you. Take a chance and let me in. Let me show you you can win, as you have never won before. Cause when I If it takes a hundred years, I can hold you. during that time that I identified myself in terms of my relationship. That if you would ask me at that time, who are you? I would have said, I am a person without a boyfriend. <laughs> and I really thought my life was over. I was almost 50, by myself, didn't know, you know how I was going to start dating or meeting anyone. And, you know, I had been left, so I thought I was worthless. And I was lying in bed one night, thinking all those things. And I suddenly had this really comforting thought come to me. And it sort of told me that whatever I was looking for had to be here already. And it was a comforting thought that I held for the next three years, which was how long, it, how long I was alone. Trying to sleep alone in my bed Thoughts of the future go round in my head How will I find a love of my own A love of the kind that I've never known Don't know where I'm going Don't know what to do But I take comfort knowing That right here and now you're out in the world, searching for me, too. You're already there, 
waiting for me Wondering where in the world I could be You go through the day Dreaming your dream Afraid that it might not come true While I'm lying here Dreaming of you You're far, far away or Just down the street But surely someday We are destined to meet I know in my heart You're coming to me I don't need to know when and where I'll just turn, and one day you'll be there. And maybe we will know at the first glance, at the first word. Or maybe we'll go slow, start out as friends. But in the end, a love to last a lifetime will grow. And that will be our story. I can't wait to live our story. So now, go to sleep, and I'll do the same. Knowing your heart, though I don't know your name. I trust in a plan much higher than me to bring us together in time. So till you appear, I'll picture you here. Remove all the doubt and let go of the fear. And know that the future is fine. You're already there. I asked myself, what is the path going to be? What is the path to healing? Now, this time I'm writing a song about something I don't know, but the difference between these, this song and the others was that I set out to explore something. It didn't just hit me on the head, this song. I set out to explore what would the path to healing this period, to finding love, to finding center, to finding something inside of myself that I could depend upon be. And it took me about six months to write this song because I didn't want to tack a platitude this ending onto it. I didn't want to sort of make up what it would be. I had to wait for it. And this song really did lay out the path that it actually turned out that I followed and to understand that uh, I could get what I wanted by letting go of it. Finally let go of waiting around for one dream to come true. I finally said no. No more living as though there were nothing to do but search for one love. And if that love didn't come along, was I nothing? Was life nothing? I finally said Hey, get out of the future, start living today. I finally said, wow, there's so much to be thankful for right here and now, and I'm missing it. Missing the smiles of my friends, missing the beauty that lives all around me, and the sunsets, and the music, the music. I finally said, wow. Keep reliving the past till the day that I die I finally said, gee, if it's gonna be different 
different. It's gonna be me who changes it. Me who lets go of the pain. Me who surrenders to this very moment to the heartbreak and the sadness and the passion and the longing and the feeling. The feeling. And then I went deep inside. And there I finally cried for all of the wishes that never came true and all of the great things I wanted to do and all of the dreams that I never would know and I let them go. I let them go. And I finally could say I can still be okay. I finally could see it was more than enough to be here, to be me, living every day. And when I was finally aware that when I'm alone, there's still someone there, and that someone is me. That someone is me. Then I finally found peace. Cause then I finally knew that happiness comes from inside of me. And then, only then, I found you. I was thinking, to see where I was cutting myself off. And so what happened was I became much less interested in being rich, famous, and powerful. I like singing the song, and it's fine. But I became much less interested, and what interestingly enough started to happen was I started to become more rich, famous, and powerful. The outside began to reflect the inside. And so the first thing that happened was I did become loved in the way I wanted to be loved. Who knew that the cranky sound man from Don't Tell Mama would turn into the unity minister of my dreams? Sean Mama. As I like to say, I'm aware that Sean does not make me happy. My happiness makes Sean. Some days my misery makes Sean. But, <laughs> and after all these years of dreaming, I have the first show that I wrote on Broadway. our first full week of previews and the cast is so exhausted I said you know just relax and if you can make it maybe Roz I am so honored that you are here she is so hysterical and touching and wonderful in this show you gotta see her it's really it's, uh... so this is a show I wrote with Kathy Lee Gifford and David Pomerantz and I wrote the music together where are you This morning on the Today Show. Did you see that? <laughs> she gave me a big mention. Where? Oh, here. Billy! Oh, yay! Oh, I love it. Billy is a huge star in Seattle who came to New York to do this show with us. We're so happy. I'm so happy you're here tonight. The show is it's about Amy Sample McPherson, who was a very controversial uh, Pentecostal 
preacher, she did healings, she healed thousands, and she was in the tabloids and married three times, and it's, it's really, it's not a religious show, it's a show about <laughs> power, about talent, and about how when you do that, and when you manifest it, the challenges you meet, and how it gets away from you, and what you have to do to get it back. And uh, it's been really interesting to work on. We're getting a wonderful response. We're really happy about it. So come down and see us if you haven't seen it. If you've seen it, come down again because every day it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in previews. So there are a lot of other wonderful things that have happened that I'll tell you about later. But the interesting thing is that, as I said, these disasters brought me very much needed information and really transformed my life. But many of the songs that I'm most well known for were written right before or around the time that I wrote Rich, Famous, and Powerful. And each of those taught me something. I might not have been so aware that they were spirits speaking to me, but in looking back, I can see how much they taught me. Now, the song Listen to My Heart, a lot of people think I wrote it for an answer a lot. Thank you. I actually didn't write it for Nancy Lamont. I wrote it for Lori Beachman, uh, another amazing, magnificent singer who we lost. We think too early. We have no way of knowing. People, someone once said to me, she said, I feel so guilty because all these people have died and I'm still here. And I thought, how do you know they're not up there saying, oh God, is she slipping in that body? We have no idea. So, Lori had just, uh, uh, she, she was going to do her first album, and I was producing it. And the way I wrote songs at that time was often to put myself in a circumstance in someone else's life and write what I felt like and what I thought it would be like. So I thought I was writing about someone else. Now, Lori had had a series of rich, famous, and powerful boyfriends who, in my estimation, she was with because she wanted them to do something for her, and then, when they didn't, she left them. That's what I made up about it. She finally met a great guy, a musician, a lovely guy who was interested in living in a small house and having a family, and I thought, this is the perfect guy for her. And if I were Lori, this is what I would have said. She dumped him in three months, but that's, you know, this was my fantasy, not hers. So anyway, Lori was set to, I, I, writing has come very, writing has not come late to me, but showing people my writing came very late to me. Writing seemed to be the most frightening thing to do, the most personal, the most revealing. So for years I hid behind music directing and working on other people's music and stuff like that, because it just seemed too frightening to me. And I finally decided I was doing a concert. It was the Cathedral St. John the Divine. It was for about a thousand people. There were 31 of my songs, and people like Lori and uh, Alex Corey and Nancy Lamont and Judy Kay and Leslie Gore and all these different wonderful singers were singing then. And it was sort of like my coming out as a writer. And we were opening with Listen to My Heart. 20 hours before the concert, I got a call from Lori, who was singing the song, to say that she had a cold and would not be making the concert. I think cold is a euphemism for a diva fit. Uh, didn't really have to do with me so much, but there was something going on and she canceled. So I was horrified. Nancy Lamont happened to call me, and she said, are you excited about tomorrow? And I said, well, excited is one word to describe it. Uh, terrified, mortified, I have no one to sing the opening number. And Nancy said, you know, I've never sung that song before, but I love it, I'll have it for you. And she, with a strategically placed music stand to make sure she had the lyrics, got up, and she blew the roof off the place. And the thing was, you know, there are different kinds of singers. I've always said, when you heard Laurie Beachman sing, and if you heard her sing, she was pretty amazing, generally you'd say, what a singer. And when you heard Nancy Lamont sing, you'd say, what a song. And so, Nancy sang that song on my behalf that night. 
Here I was, you and I at last in the right place at the right time. Listen to my heart. She sang it, and as I watched, it's on film, it's actually, we have the, you know, it's on the, the, the Nancy Lamont, uh, uh, I'll Be Here With You DVD, and you can see my face that I kind of understood at that moment that I'm always writing about myself, even if I think I'm writing on someone else, and that I have to write. And so, this is Listen to My Heart. <laughs> Here we are, you and I at last, in the right place, at the right time. Every dream I've dreamed has come to pass, cause you're right here, and you're all mine. I can't believe the years of holding back are through, and I can finally share what's in my heart with you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart, listen to it sing, listen to my voice, it wants to tell you everything. There's so much to say, I don't know where to start But if you want to know the love I'm feeling Listen to my heart All my life, I've been on a road Going one way, toward one dream The road would wind, and down it I would go Always searching, never finding But even in my darkest hour I always knew That someday, somehow, the road would lead to you And words can't express how my heart's filled with happiness Listen to it, listen to my heart This next song. It was written. There was a there was a concert that used to happen every year called uh, in celebration of life that Johnson Darcy used to do, and he still does so many wonderful concerts. And in this concert, he paired writers and singers up, and he had us 
write songs that would be about healing or that would be about something to do with the AIDS crisis. Um, so Nancy and I always closed that concert and I did a new song for her each year. And this one year I said, what do you want to sing about? And she said, I was on the bus today and there was this bitch who was so nasty to me. Could you write a song about people being nice to each other? So, I thought, my mother had always said to me, be nice. And now, when I did this, the last time I did this uh, kind of show, 12 years ago, which was actually the first time I did it, at the Firebird, nine days before the show, my mother died. And, uh, Actually, six weeks ago, my father, who's here tonight, had a very mild... <laughs> I was sitting in a restaurant, which was where I... I was sitting in a restaurant when I got the word about my mother, and I got a call that my father had had a stroke. And uh, it turned out to be a very mild stroke. It just sort of limited his vocabulary for a few weeks, which was really fine with me. <laughs> but I got that news and I thought, if you die before this act, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> but my dad is more than fine and he's here tonight. Um, So he was, of course, here 12 years ago, and I talked to him, and we, we decided that even though my mother had just died, that I should do this concert, and the family should be here 12 years ago. So I thought, how am I going to tell an audience that my mother just died without, you know, bringing them all into a heap on the floor? So what I said was, I said, you know, we each have things that we remember about our mothers. And my favorite is my friend Marie who, when her mother died, I called her and I said, Marie, now that your mother's gone, is there anything I can do for you? And she said, oh, well, you could call me once a month and ask me why I'm not married. <laughs> so, What I remember about my mother is she always said, be nice. My father used to say that arguing with your mother is like punching a balloon. The editor goes right back to her. Right back to her. So my mother said, be nice, and I sang this 12 years ago on her behalf, in her memory, and I sing it tonight for the same reason. So many hurts that happen every day So many heartaches that pierce the soul So much pain that won't ever go away How do we make it better? How do we make it through? What can we do when there's nothing we can do? We can be kind, we can take care of each other, we can remember that deep down inside we all need the same thing. And maybe we'll find, if we are there for each other, that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may. really wants to fight. Nobody really wants to go to war. Everyone wants to make things right. So what are we always fighting for? Does nobody want to see it? Does nobody understand? The power to heal is right here. 
here in our hands. We can be kind, we can take care of each other, we can remember that deep down inside we all need the same thing. And maybe we'll find, if we are there for each other, that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may bring. And it's not enough to talk about it, not enough to sing a song. We must walk the walk about it. You and I, do or die, we've got to try. of mind if we always remember we can be supposed to live six months, she lived nine years. And in that time, she starred in Les Mis, she starred in Cats, she did concerts, she got married, she sang at Clinton's second inauguration. She really lived a full life and she just kept fighting and kept going. And at one point, she came over and she said, I'd like you to write a song about my cancer. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, what could I possibly say about Lori Beachman's cancer that anyone would want to hear? But as I thought about it, and as I realize now, as that question was asked to me because it was opening me to the voice of spirit to learn things that I would need to learn, I realized that we are all here for a limited amount of time, and when we're faced with a diagnosis, we're kind of, that's right in our face. And I thought, what might be the positive side of knowing that we are here for a limited amount of time? And I realized that what that could do is make you grateful for every moment, for every friend, for every kindness, and even grateful for every challenge, for every problem, for every issue. Aren't we lucky to be having these problems? You know, we are poor us We're sitting on Broadway every day trying to figure out how to make the show better. Oh, what a trial. You know? <laughs> and Sean comes with me in the show and he pokes me and says, you're on Broadway. <laughs> so it made me think that that really, there are so many reasons to appreciate right now and to appreciate this life. And this song also helped me any time I was going to do something that might be potentially challenging or painful and also helped me a great deal because as we get older, we begin to lose people. And it just helped me handle all that. So this is We Live on Borrowed Time. I 
never thought that there could be a love like yours and mine. I never dreamed that I would see the day that I would find a love that feels so right. But here we are tonight, and now the only thing we really need is time. We live on borrowed time. No one can be sure when the loan will finally come due. But I'm loving all of mine. I know what time is for. I've borrowed it so I could spend it all right here with you. There was a time when I believed that life held guarantees. There was a time when I was sure my future was secure. But life had other plans. The future's in God's hands. And knowing that has let me live and love you more. We live on borrowed time. Yesterday is past. Tomorrow seems a million miles away, but I promise you that I'm gonna make love last by living every moment, every hour, every day. Now we may have a year, and we may have a lifetime. No one can be certain what the future will allow, but you and I very special to me because it's the first song I ever wrote for Nancy Lamont. And I wrote it because she called me from the road and she said, I'm getting kind of tired of my closing number and I'd like to find, could you write me something that would make people feel good about themselves, that would send them out with a sense of hope, with a sense of positiveness. And uh, so I wrote this song and we were in the middle of, we had just finished recording her first album and we hadn't, it hadn't gone to print yet, but it was done, it was mixed. And she sang this song at uh, Steve McGraw's, which is the club owned by Steve and Nancy McGraw. And Nancy McGraw came up to me afterwards and said, oh my God, I can't wait to hear that song on the album. And I said, it's not on the album. <laughs> but something about how, how insistent she was and how excited she was made us go back in and open up the album and put it on the album. And uh, so we, put it on that album, and what's happened with that song, it really became Nancy's trademark, and then uh, the year she died, 1995, she sang it at the Palace Theatre uh, to close the Easter Bonnet competition, and it has been the song that closed the Easter Bonnet competition each year with a different Broadway star, whether it was Kristen Chenoweth, Idina Menzel, uh, uh, Valerie Esparza, all sorts of fabulous people have sung that song. And when I wrote it, what I did was, each line, I thought of a different friend or a different person in my life and what they might need to hear at a particular time in a problem that they were having. 
And so, as you listen to this, I hope one of these lines is for you. Don't give up the ship Even when you feel it's sinking And you don't know what to do Don't give up your dream Even though you may be thinking It never will come true Life has its own ideas of how things come about And if you just hang in there Life is gonna work it out Help is on the way From places you don't know about today From friends you may not have met yet Believe me when I say I know Help is on the way You don't have to know where the path you're on is leading. You just have to walk along, dreaming as you go, asking for the things you're needing. You never can go wrong if you have faith that things are happening as they should. And just believe each step you take is leading you to something good. CDs with 30 songs of mine with me singing them. And uh, I'm very excited about it and, you know, that I could finally put down the way I hear them. I, I get the pleasure of so many wonderful people singing my songs and this is just me singing them. They're for sale in the lobby with my book and DVDs of Nancy and, and uh, audiobooks and songbooks and everything. So just go to the store if you want to and buy them. Uh, so, anyway, these two albums, the first one is called A Different Light, David Friedman sings his own songs, and the second one is called Let Me Fly, David Friedman sings more of his own songs. <laughs> and I'd like to sing the title songs from these two albums. A Different Light, I wrote many, many years ago. This is an interesting thing, because this is an example of something's coming through me that I don't even know what it means, but I know what it means now and I have that song to listen to. You know, I'm always reminded of Harold Pinter being interviewed and uh, someone said to him, what does that line mean in his own work? And he looked at it and said, hmm, the author's intention is unclear. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't always know what we're talking about. And when people come to me and say, oh, you know, you are so, you, the songs you write, you must be so wise and so centered and so relaxed. And 
I say to them, if you think I think help is on the way, you're out of your mind. And I definitely do not trust the wind. These are things that I'm being told to do that I have as much trouble as the next guy doing. Uh, but a different light, I was assigned something. This is another way in which spirit has spoken to me, is you're asked to write something. You're assigned something and you do it for an assignment and you suddenly realize it's something you needed to do. I was assigned to do a song for a children's uh, video about being afraid of the dark and what that meant. And I realized today, looking at it, that, you know, we are all children afraid of the dark in certain ways. But what we're afraid of, we actually don't need to be afraid of if we look at it differently. So this song is called A Different Light. afraid of the dark Nothing is gonna hurt you The shadows you see will turn out to be just shadows Believe me Don't you be scared of the night Everything's gonna be alright The sun's gonna rise and you'll be surprised how beautiful things are in a different light. A different light can change the way you look at things. A different light can alter what you see. Fear turns to relief. Joy replaces grief. Doubt becomes belief in a different light. When you're alone in your bed, frightening thoughts can dance in your head. Something you fear or something you hear in the darkness can scare you. Things that go bump in the night Sometimes can give you a terrible fright But it's all in your mind And you're gonna find the world is looking bright In a different light So close your eyes And dream sweet dreams And feel the love that's all around you Nothing scary Columbia crash, the, the, the crash of the space shuttle, and I began thinking about astronauts. You wanted me to write something about astronauts for NASA. If there's anyone from NASA here who's interested in having a song, just please grab me afterwards. It's interesting, when I did that big concert at Cathedral St. John the Divine, I put in my bio, David Friedman has written songs for Barbra Streisand, for Dionne Warwick, for Diana Ross, for Bette Midler. They haven't sung them yet, but he's written them. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> I began thinking about astronauts and how they go into space. They go somewhere where you don't know what's going to happen, and but they they find new horizons that we never would have thought of. I was talking to my dad a few months ago, and he said, you know, when the space program started, we thought, what are they doing? They're just, you know, it's all ego. They want to go into space. They want to prove something. Well, GPS, cell phones, uh, all sorts of things that we use today are from that space program. And so I began to think, in terms of an inner trip into space, what would be the value? What are they doing that is so brave that we may we need to be as brave about in our own lives. What are they setting an example for? And uh, the song, uh, Let Me Fly, came out of that. I have gazed into the night and looked up at the stars and wondered if there might be life out there on Mars. Don't know if I can get there, but I sure would like to try. Let me dream, let me dare, let me fly. Let me break the surly bonds of this gravity, I know. Let the fear that has been holding me finally let me go. Let me see my dreams come true, not just stand here standing by. Let me through, let me fly, let me fly beyond the sky and into outer space. Let me look back at the earth and see a different place. From out there, I'll see no borders, no enemies. skipped where Bambi and his father, did you know Bambi was a boy? Yeah. Bambi was a boy. Where Bambi and his father developed their relationship. And uh, so the song was the opening song and it was about uh, Bambi's mother's death and how everything is cold and it's winter and it's frozen and they asked me to write a song about how no matter how bad things get, no matter how frozen, no matter hopeless, there is always hope. There is always a natural renewal in nature that happens. And uh, so I, you know, looked into myself and thought, okay, what can I write about this? The thing about writing for Disney that's interesting is, you know, you're dealing with all the market research, all the corporates and stuff like that, but you also know that uh, millions of people are going to hear what you write. So you try and inject a little spirit into it whenever you can. So this is called There Is Life.
Under the snow, beneath the frozen streams, there is life. You have to know, when nature sleeps, she dreams, there is life. And the cold, or the wind, or the warm, or the spring, the deeper the sorrow, the more our hearts sing. Even when you can't see it inside everything. strange. Someone once asked me, did you sign for that movie yet? And I said, sign for the movie? I haven't gotten the insulting offer. I haven't told them to drop dead. They haven't told me I have no talent. I haven't told them to go screw themselves. None of those basics have happened. Uh, and one of the other things, you know, you're in Hollywood and you're dealing with kids. So after I brought this song in, one of the 18-year-old executives... <laughs> <laughs> said to me, you can't say forever at the end of the song because we don't live forever. So I mentioned that to my partner, the Reverend Sean, and he said, I find that fascinating because Bambi's dead mother is singing the song. <laughs> so... <laughs> so... We're coming to the end of the evening. We're coming to the, the fake exit. So, no, no, don't walk off, because I'll be back. But uh, this last song... Uh, this, was, this is a song I wrote about 30 years ago. And I wrote it because I just wanted to write a hip-hop song. And I wrote it as a generic love song. It was really meaningful to me, but I just wrote it. And it turns out that it certainly is the song that I've made the most money on. There's no question about that. I had a quadruple platinum hit with Diana Ross on it. Laura Branigan sang it. It was my first song to be on television. 
But as I look at it today, uh, I realize that it has a lot of other meanings. All about love, but it's not just about loving one person. It's about love in general. It's about loving the higher spirit, the source that gave it to me, whatever we want to call it. And tonight, I, I just can't tell you how grateful I am to you all for being here. Uh, it just warms my heart. I want to thank Phil Bond. Phil Bond has gently, <laughs> gently poked at me for several years. When are you going to do a show? When are you going to do a show? And I, I, I really resisted, but I'm so grateful that he kept asking yeah. just one more time. Because no I'm yeah. thank you. I want to thank Chuck Meraki and Keith Sherman and everyone who publicized me so that you would know I was here. And KJ on Lights and Sounds, you are fantastic. It's a joy to be here. And the whole staff has been wonderful. The whole staff has been delightful. I, I haven't eaten the food, but I smelled it while we were rehearsing. And uh, so please be generous to your wait staff. I haven't even noticed you during this. Isn't that wonderful? So thank you, everybody. And this song is for you.
walk off and waste time. I didn't even <laughs> pretend that Nancy Lamont said you always had to go to the back of the house. And I just have one more song. Yeah, yeah, they're giving me time. I know we're running over. Uh, this year, or I was earlier in the year, I was offered. A, I was given a lifetime achievement award by the Mac Awards. And there were people who said, uh, "Hmm, does that mean it's all over?" Now, when I was given this award, I uh, I was remind I was given it. The other recipient of it was Irvin Drake. Now, Irvin Drake is an icon. And he's about 30 years older than I am, and uh, he's written things like I Believe, and It Was a Very Good Year, and Good Morning Heartache. And I was reminded, yeah, we could go on forever. And I was reminded of a of time, I thought this might be another moment where I got a fleeting moment of recognition. There was, uh, I was at the Russian Tea Room years ago seeing Julie Halston, and uh, I was very excited about seeing her, and Faith Stewart Gordon, who ran the Russian Tea Room, got up and uh, said, ladies and gentlemen, we have two celebrities in the audience this evening. Composer David Friedman and Gina Lola Brigida. <laughs> so that was the end of me. <laughs> I went, hi Gina, you know, she's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> but I've chosen to take that award as, as um, a sign that of encouragement, as a sign of the uh, acknowledgement and encouragement. And I was thinking, when I was putting this act together, my dad is here tonight and he's 91 years old. Yeah. He you know, drives his car between his two homes. He's one of the grand poobahs of the Masons. He, he studies everything from astrophysics to comparative religions. And I started to think, when he was my age, I was 33. I had written none of the songs you heard tonight. I hadn't met Nancy Lamont. I hadn't met Sean. I hadn't even met my previous partner. I hadn't come to Unity, which has been my spiritual home. I, I hadn't, there were so many things that I hadn't done that I think, who knows how much time I have, but whatever time I do have, I will do a lot with it. There's a lot more to be done. There are a lot of things I want to do. And just now we have to finish up. I just want to introduce two friends who have been great friends to us, and we're so excited that they're sitting with my dad and with Sean, Lucy Arnaz, and Larry Lockwood. Yeah. 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 So, my songs have taught me that there's no problem that can't be solved, that there are answers that I don't know about, that, that, there is a voice that I can always listen to, and that everything that seemed to be terrible turned out to have some tremendous value. And I'm thinking, as long as I have on this earth, maybe death will be that way too. Maybe death will be something fantastic and a great surprise and something wonderful. And these last two songs, the first one, I had the honor of writing with Portia Nelson and singing it at her memorial service. And uh, it, yes, she's a wonderful writer and how, this is how I would like to be remembered. And the second one I think is self-explanatory. <laughs> seasons come and seasons go and somehow they were meant to show that life and love are never really gone. So when my journey here is through, I'm certain there is just a new hello. And so, when I travel on, let me be the music, let me be the music of love I have known. The melodies, the wind and the trees that sing to the lost and the lone. Let me be the sweet refrain in the sound of the rain, or a rippling 
to the stars and makes us one in its embrace. It has no fences. It has no gender. So let me be the music, the beautiful music of let me be the voices of spring that rejoice in the things that blossom and grow. Oh, let me be the music to come again as music, the beautiful music of Don't be afraid. 